And then there's the whole like the midlife crisis and a Porsche and a girlfriend and whatever and all that. But we don't really talk about what's going on psychologically or spiritually. The transitions in our lives can bring up difficult feelings. It's easy to see the lay of the land when we're walking a straight path. But when the sidewalk ends, all kinds of confusion can come up. We may lose track of where we're going and even start to question our values. How can ceremony help us through the transformations in our lives? Join me for a conversation with Betty Ray. This is Shame Pinata. I'm Colleen Thomas. Welcome to Shame Pinata, where we talk about creating rites of passage for real life transitions. Today, we're going to slow it down and really look at rites of passage. Where did that term come from? What's the anatomy of a rite of passage? And what can these ceremonies be used for? Our returning guest, Betty Ray, helps parents design customized ceremonies to help their youth go through a coming-of-age process, something that is deeply needed in American culture today. But she understands that all big transitions are worthy of the same process, whether it's coming-of-age, approaching midlife, or even experiencing a significant loss. Betty and I had a conversation recently about using the rites of passage structure to design a healing ceremony. This could be any kind of healing ceremony, but I asked her how the rites of passage structure could be useful to design a ceremony for someone who had lost a child. I think the the language rites of passage to me is more structural because rites of passage articulates a structure. There's a three-part structure to rites of passage, which is immutable and across all these different cultures. And that is really a benefit because that gives us a way in which we can design meaningful personalized rites of passage or healing rituals or or um, however you want to describe it. There's lots of ways. But I think the language around rites of passage for me has been to articulate this tripartite model, which is so powerful. The first phase of rites of passage is called separation. And this was from the work of Arnold Van Gennep. And this was from 1909. So this is guys long time ago studied all these different cultures and found across cultures and across time and space that people were using these same three phases. And in fact, Joseph Campbell was really inspired by Van Gennep's work and used his rites of passage work for the hero's journey work, which was amazing. Like I was, didn't know that. And I, did you know that? Mm-hmm. Oh my God. I was so excited about that. I was like, oh, you're kidding me. That's so brilliant. Cause I've just, that makes sense that our rites of passage would make a good story. So the, the three, three steps are separation where the initiate leaves the comforts of home. And whether that's a young person going off to figure out who they are and f- discover their identity or a middle-aged person who has to leave the sort of the structure that their life has become. So then the second phase is called liminality or also I've heard it referred to as metamorphosis and that's the phase where once they've left they're kind of betwixt and between as Victor Turner said it's this time where you don't know what's going to happen to you and that's when this beautiful phase of ego death comes in. You don't know, you die. Who you are, who you were is no longer who you are and or who you want to be. And so then there's design elements that can make liminality more or less, that's a design challenge for those of us who want to do these. And then the reincorporation phase where the young person or the middle elder or whoever is, comes back to wherever they were, to the original you know, container, and then takes what they've learned and brings it back to, so that they may be in their community once again. So there's kind of a, you go off into the Netherlands, you go off to the weird world, the forest, you know, in our mythologies, all kinds of heroes' journeys there. So, yeah, so those three phases, I feel like, are really valuable as as design elements. So that's why I was talking about that. And we can talk about, like, how to put this into someone who's lost a child. How do we manage that, the feelings and the grief and the identity and all of the elements that, the psychological elements that have, that go into holding that? How does one release that and reinvent themselves to be able to move forward and to not just be completely paralyzed by that loss. Because mm-hmm. it's, I think what I love about 
rites of passage, however you talk about them, is that they do offer uh, tools for composting our grief or our fear yeah. or whatever. And that's that, you know, getting it out and turning it into something else. The transformative nature is really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. What's the benefit in designing our own ceremonies? I think that our 21st century culture has become so individualized that certain kinds of rites of passage, the generic thing, just don't resonate. And so the benefit of a personalized sort of self-designed DIY rite of passage or transition ceremony is that it can be something that is deeply meaningful to you. And I don't think these work if they're not deeply meaningful to you. So I would argue that there is no reason, there, there's no reason to do this if it isn't personalized. It's really important that it be meaningful and that it come from a place that is so, has such heart and meaning that it does the sort of psychological lifting. When it is individualized, it's a creative process. It's really fun. It's really fun to think about what is the thing that nurtures me. It's really fun to think about what is the thing that I'm trying to heal. It's not fun. That's not fun. <laughs> but, it's, but it's healing. It's healthy to look at what is the thing that I want to let go of and how do I design something so that I can take back my power over this thing that has really hurt me or has humiliated me or has, that I want to leave behind. And that can be anything from a relationship to a mindset, you know? It's a lot different than talking it out in therapy. And I love therapy. I go to therapy. It's valuable. But get, again, getting into this psychic space of ego death, right? You're kind of more open and vulnerable and you kind of like, you're, you're working with the programming language of the soul. And it's a lot deeper than just the cognitive yeah. stuff. We don't, cognitive is, is, is important, but the, when you're working at the soul level, it's more potent. I love that way of describing it, that what we're doing in ritual is working with the programming language of the soul. Does that make sense? We're getting into an area where words don't work, so it's a little bit difficult for me to use words to describe it. But think of the rituals you've participated in in your life, and remember what they felt like in your body. There's a reason we do devotional ritualized practices in religious settings. Taking the bread, stepping into the mikvah, casting a circle with the athame. These are physical things we do to connect, ritualistic soul-level actions we take. They are separate from our thoughts. When we hear the phrase rites of passage, we may think of life stages such as coming of age, getting married, or having children. But life transitions are not always predictable or planned. A sudden illness or loss can knock us off our game and create a need to withdraw and heal. That's where rites of passage or ritual can become invaluable. Ritual can provide a space of deep healing where our pain can be witnessed and honored. When I was about 25, I was involved in a bike accident and I was not wearing a helmet and I was unconscious for a day or two and I woke up in the hospital and I was all like double vision, concussion, a real mess. And I, um, I got out of the hospital and I was like in bed, you know, I couldn't work. I was out and I was just really discombobulated and I had this major double vision and I was so like... I couldn't even, you know, literally couldn't see straight. And um, I, my mom called me, you know, and she said, I would like to offer you a rite of passage at my house. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but it has to be better than this, wherever I am right now, this sucks and I'm in bed and I would love to be sure, whatever that is, do it up. And so she said, okay, I want you to invite somewhere between six and 10 women that are older that you look up to and that you respect. And I was like, okay. And so I, you know, she knew some cool people and I knew a few cool people and I put together this list and they all came to her house on the winter solstice. And um, one of her friends had made me a paper mache mask to wear for the ceremony. And it was like this beautiful thing that had a butterfly at the mouth and like flower up at the head and like these beautiful beads. And it was really, I was like, okay, so I put that on. I went to, you know, we came to her house. There was a fire in the fireplace and all these women were sitting in a circle and I wore the mask. And they proceeded to 
each tell me a story or read a poem or kind of reflect me or reflect the world so that I could kind of titrate it and understand it. Some things about the world, things that were, you know, po through poetry and beautiful writings and pieces of art. And I just sat there and just absorbed this m giant mirror of all these older women that were so wise and so loving and so interested in helping me heal. And I could just feel that energy and I'm wearing this mask. And then at the end of it, I had to, I had to write based on everything I had heard, I had to write a series of commitments to myself and like things I wanted to keep, things I wanted to nurture, things I wanted to deepen and explore. And then I had to write a series of things that I was ready to release. And she had a fire in the fireplace. And at the time I took the things I wanted to release and I put them in the fire and we said a prayer and then it was over. And it was probably about 20 minutes. It was a short thing, maybe more. I don't remember, maybe it must've been more, but Anyway, it was really powerful to me to, to have all these older women hold me in that way, taught me the power and to experience the intentionality of that moment, the gravitas, the beauty, you know, she, the home was beautiful. It smelled nice. It was people, you know, there was just a sensory experience of being in this kind of like other world. And, um, and the kind of the grace that I felt afterwards was just like, wow, I knew this was powerful. And I was really interested in doing more of it. I was in my mid-20s. And I remember kind of putting it out there and sort of doing a little bit of research after it was over, like kind of getting out of my depression hole and going down to the bookstore and researching a little bit. And I got this clear picture that this is too woo-woo for the world. I can't do this now. It's not ready. It's too weird. And so I took a hard turn and I went into writing about popular culture and, you know, teaching myself technology and HTML. And like, I kind of went there, but it always stuck with me. It was always part of my soul. You know, it was like, I was awake. I was like, wow, that's a cool thing. You can do this stuff and it really helps your soul. It helps you get out of, you know, self-pity and suicidal ideation and, you know, kind of loneliness and all this crap that I, and, and I, my physical thing didn't change. I still have the crazy double vision, but I was just, it was a, something that changed in my being. Mm. So, um, you know, but over the years I sort of dabbled in it, you know, I kind of come back to it and I found it on the dance floor and I really found like dancing really helped me with the soul work. And, you know, I would take a astrology thing here and there, like kind of like a closet woo woo, you know? <laughs> And then I, I found this program at, you know, at Columbia, right? Like fancy pants, Ivy League school has this woo-woo little thing called the Spirituality Mind Body Institute. And it's actually not woo-woo. It's a bunch of researchers who have found evidence for the benefits of spiritual exploration and spiritual experience. And that, I was like, okay, it's coming out. Now it's time. <laughs> You're going in. <laughs> so I took that program. I quit my job and I um, am now working on the rites of passage stuff. Lisa Miller, the woman who founded the SMBI, the Spirituality Mind Body Institute, has done all kinds of really interesting research on the power of intergenerational spirituality. Mm -hmm. So she she says that when a young person has a container, a community, yeah. you know, who are holding them in a place where they can explore lowercase s spiritual practices, they're so much healthier. They have a much much higher, much lower rate of depression anxiety, mm -hmm. self-harm, suicide. And it's like 60-ish percent. It's wow. ridiculously wow. powerful. One of my favorite things about ritual is that it can transcend space and time. What I mean by that is if there's something that's happened in our past, maybe a hard time we went through all alone, or a significant personal accomplishment that got overlooked by our friends and family, we can actually do ceremony for it now and bring some healing to both the past and the present versions of ourselves. That may sound strange if you're new to the concept of ceremony, but if you do this work regularly, you know what I'm talking about. My first experience of this was when I read a book called Red Flower, Rethinking Menstruation by Dina Taylor. It inspired me to create the menarche ceremony that I never had. Because ritual transcends space and time, it didn't matter that the ceremony took place 15 years after my first period. My inner 12-year-old was fully present and felt fully welcomed into womanhood that day. I asked Betty to reflect on her past and think of any transitions she wished she'd had a rite of passage for. In answering my question, she spoke about a very personal subject. She spoke about healing from an abortion. 
I'm pausing to give you a heads up now in case this subject is close to home for you or in case you are listening with small children. Are there any experiences in your past that you wish you could have had a rite of passage for? There are several. I had an abortion and that was the biggest source of shame ever. And I had no no way of I mean I had there was it was very difficult to like make peace with that or understand you know kind of talk nobody talked about it so having some sort of a you know there's an Amanda Palmer song about it's like an abortion mm-hmm. it's a ceremony mm-hmm. and it's beautiful and I sobbed the first time I heard it I think having that would have been a good idea it would have been a way to heal that in a way that was Good for me. Although what I did do is I I ended up moving out to California from Minnesota to um, honor that. It was like, I'm not ready to be a mom here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go do whatever it takes for me to know that I can be a parent. Mm -hmm. And that means going out to California and sort Mm -hmm. of following an instinct that there's work out there for me that will not only be meaningful and enrich me, but will help others. Mm Like, I wanted to be able to have an authentic sense of myself in the world, and I just had no way of doing that where I was. Mm -hmm. So coming out here was sort of that Mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the same, and it was certainly not witnessed. No one knew. Mm -hmm. No one knew about it. Mm -hmm. You know, that was my own sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I've heard that in the Blood Mysteries for Women that that's one of the blood mysteries, you know, that's, really? that, that's got that same depth as, or is considered in some circles by some healers to be in the same depth of, you know, menarche, menstruation, menopause, birth, and um, abortion, wow. miscarriage even, you know, just know that. This, that it's that, it's that really deep, really, really deep place. It is. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. it's very confrontive because it, it forces you to look at your life in a way of like, you're at this giant fork, right? And like, what are the resources over here? What is my capacity? What is that? What does that life look like? And what does the life look like on the other direction? And they're they're You can't go through it unchanged because yeah. it causes right. such reflection right. Right. and it causes such anguish. And mm-hmm. it's so, it's very complicated. <laughs> so it definitely, you know, I think it, it just transforms you. And so for me, moving out here was like, thank you little spirit Mm. you know it was all in the in the Mm. in an attempt to to be able to welcome that little spirit back someday Mm. and I don't know that I did I don't know if my daughter is the same little spirit but Mm -hmm. um certainly there is a little spirit now too (laughs) (laughs) wow thank you I am so very grateful to Betty for giving us the lowdown on the anatomy of a rite of passage and for sharing with us so vulnerably I encourage you to think back and notice if there's anything in your past it might have been helpful to have a rite of passage for. It's not too late. Together with a group of friends and family, people who can take your healing seriously and honor your story, you can go back and have the transition witnessed. Betty Ray is a speaker, author, and consultant who uses design thinking to co-create meaningful rites of passage to help her clients navigate transitions. Learn more about her work at BettyRay.net. If you're a parent or work with youth, be sure to catch her talk, We Must Initiate the Young People, on YouTube. Check out our show notes for links to that, plus more information about Arnold Van Gennep and also Lisa Miller of the Spirituality Mind Body Institute. Our music is by Terry Hughes. If you like the show, please take a minute to review it on Apple Podcasts. Learn more at shamepinata.com. I'm Colleen Thomas. Thanks for listening. Thank you.